Well, hello everybody and welcome back to Anatomy 2. The topics of the thorax and abdomen. My name is Hua. I am uh, a lecturer of anatomy, physiology, and medical terminology at Hongbai University. And today we are going to explore the lungs and the pleura. All right. So first off, we are going to have to talk a little bit about the general orientation of the thoracic cavity. How is the thoracic cavity laid out? Okay. So the thoracic cavity is this chest cavity right here. That begins up here with the inlet of the thoracic cavity up here. And down here is going to terminate by the diaphragm. Okay. So the superior, superior um, uh, boundary of the thoracic cavity is going to be this uh, this thoracic inlet up here. And down here, you can see that the diaphragm makes up the inferior boundary of it. On the lateral sides, you will have the ribs, okay? And the ribs is going to protect the chest, the thoracic cavity, and it is going to be called collectively the rib cage, okay? And the rib cage is going to protect the thoracic cavity. So now, where are the lungs located? Now, the lungs and their associated pleura are going to be on either side. So here, this is one pleural cavity, and this is another pleural cavity, okay? And the pleural cavity is going to contain the lungs right here, this mass right here, this brownish mass right here, okay? This is the right lung. This is going to be the left lung. And surrounding the lungs, we are going to have two different pleura. There is going to be this visceral pleura, which is going to be a membrane that is right on top of the lung. And you will have a parietal pleura that is going to be another membrane that is outside of the visceral pleura. So now in between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura, you have this thin pleural cavity that is filled with just a thin film of fluid in light so that the visceral pleura and parietal pleura can slide on top of one another and facilitate respiration in a normal person. Okay, so now, Remember that the lung and the pleura, or should I say pleurine, because that's two of them, are going to together make up the pleural cavity. So the pleural cavity are going to be the parietal and visceral pleura, the pleural cavity plus the lungs on either side. Okay, so this is the right pleural cavity. This is the left pleural cavity. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Now, the mediastinum is going to be this structure here right in the middle. And the mediastinum is going to contain the heart over here, as well as the great vessels that come out from the heart, as well as some other structures like the esophagus, the trachea, whatever, whatever. And we are going to look at them more in the mediastinum and heart lecture. Okay. Now, the mediastinum is going to be uh, covered um, by membranes. Okay. And the mediastinum is going to contain a lot of structures like the heart, the great vessels, the trachea, the esophagus, the azygous venous system, thoracic duct, and more. All right, so let us explore more into the lung. Okay, so as I said, the lungs lies in the pleural cavities on either side. There are two of them. There is a right lung and there is a left lung. Okay, now the two lungs are the organs of respiration, as most of you have known. Okay, in inspiration, the lungs are going to expand, and this expansion of the lungs causes air to flow from the outside to the inside. You will learn about that more as, as well as all the pressures that are involved in this process more in physiology, okay? So the lungs lie on either side of the mediastinum in the middle here, okay? So the lungs just lie on either side of the middle cavity, basically, and they are surrounded by the right and left pleural cavities, as we have already said before, okay? Now, the air enters and leaves the lungs via these main bronchi, okay? So just imagine, you have the trachea that goes down here like this, okay? The trachea is also called your windpipe, okay? And it extends all the way from your larynx up here, all the way down into this junction right here, you see? This junction here is called the carina, okay? And at this carina, you will have two uh, bronchi, the primary bronchi that is going to branch one to the right and one to the left, okay? We call these bronchi the primary bronchi, and we will look at the tracheal bronchial tree a little bit closer in the upcoming slides. All right. So now the right lung is going to be normally bigger than the left lung. 
Okay, I'm going to say any idea why, but I guess I'm just going to explain it right here because I know you guys don't have a lot of time. Okay, now the right lung is normally bigger than the left lung simply because of the fact that in the left lung, you have this area right here. You see that? This area of indentation right here accommodates the heart. And therefore, you call it the cardiac notch. Cardiac means heart, okay? So the cardiac notch is only on the left lung, and therefore the left lung is a little bit smaller than the right lung because the right lung doesn't have one. It doesn't have a cardiac notch, okay? So that's why the left lung is a little bit smaller than the right one. Now, each lung has a half cone shape with a base down here. You see that? That's the base right here. Okay, that's the base of the right, and that's the base of the left lung. And the bases of the two lungs, they will sit on top of the diaphragm, sit superior, more superior to the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is this sheet of muscle down here that is going to separate the thoracic cavity up here from the abdominal cavity down here. And the bases of the lung are going to just sit right on top of that. Now, the apex of the lung, or should I say APC, because there are two apexes, Okay, so there's one on the right and one on the left. The two apexes are going to project way far superiorly. In fact, they will project above rib one and into the root of the neck. Okay, and if you, and, and in patients, you can actually use a stethoscope to put at the base of the neck in order to, to auscultate the sound coming from the apex of the lung. Rather quite magical, actually. But... This is actually quite dangerous also, because if it is that close to the base of the neck, any procedures that involves the base of the neck has the tendency to go in and rupture the pleural membrane surrounding this apex region of the lung. And therefore, it can lead to consequences such as pneumothorax uh, right here on this area. Okay, so now the lung has two main surfaces. One surface is called a costal surface, and another one is the mediastinal surface. The costal surface of the lung is all of the things that you see here, okay? All the things that you see here are going to be costal surface. The surface that is like anterior to the lung, lateral, and extending posterior of the lung, okay? Then you see that is the costal surface. It's a little bit difficult to see in this uh, diagram, but we will examine it more carefully when we come to the uh, practical portion of this lesson, all right? So now next stop, we will have the mediastinal surface. And just like its name suggests, the mediastinal surface is this surface right here that is in contact with the mediastinum in the middle. Remember, the mediastinum is this structure right in the middle, okay? So the surface of the lung right here and right here that is in contact with that mediastinal structures in the middle is going to be called the mediastinal surface. So now the lungs also have three borders, the inferior, the anterior, and the posterior border. The inferior border is just like the name suggests, it's going to be this border extending from here all the way to the back of the lung in the inferior side, okay, like that. Now, the posterior border is the border that's right here in the back. And the anterior border is this border on the front, okay? So those are the three borders of the lung. All right, so now the lungs are going to lie adjacent to, which means close to, and are going to be indented by many structures, okay? Especially if you look at the medial surface or the mediastinal surface of the lung. You see that? That is the mediastinal surface because it gets um, close to contact with the structures of the mediastinum. And you can see that the surface of the lung here are going to be indented by several structures. You see, one structure is like this one, Another structure is like this one. Another structure can be this one, okay? And this is the huge indentation by the heart, none other than the heart, okay? And over here, you can see that there are also indentations on the left side, including the indentations of the heart right here. And that's why you have a cardiac notch right here. You see that? There is a structure right here that curves into uh, a major vessel shape that is indented on the surface that along on the posterior side as well, and that's the aorta. Okay, and there are many, many indentations, and I'm not going to be able to tell you all about those indentations here in this lecture, but you guys should look at an atlas, okay, uh, an anatomy atlas to see what these indentations are and what structures makes up these indentations, okay? All right, so those indentations 
are going to be indentations of different organs. Like, for example, I already told you that this indentation is by the heart, okay? As well as the major vessel, like, for example, the aorta right here, as well as the three branches of the aorta right here, the ribs, okay? The indentations of the ribs are actually outside. So you, you see these little notches right here? Those are basically rib indentation on the lateral surface of the lung. All right. The diaphragm is going to left its mark down here. You see it at the base of the lung right here. Okay. But there are other structures that is not anatomical, but it also going to leave marks on the lung should there should it be present long enough and be in contact with the lung long enough. Like for example, tumor. Okay. Or other pathologies. All right. So now let's talk about this structure right here. You see that? Each lung has one structure like that, and we call it the root of the lung. Now, if you section the root of the lung very, very close to the lung, it becomes what is known as the hilum of the lung. So for your purposes, you can think of the root of the lung and the hilum of the lung are somewhat similar to each other. Okay, So the root of the lung is this short tubular connection to structures that together attach the lung to structures in the mediastinum. Okay, so these structures right here, you see these pulmonary veins, these pulmonary arteries, and the bronchi, okay, on either side, they are going to come from the middle. You see, the bronchi, they come from what? The trachea going down, okay, in the middle, mediastinum, okay. Now, the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary veins, they go from and to which structure? The heart. And where is the heart located again? The mediastinum. And therefore, all of these structures are going to come from or go to the mediastinal structures like the heart, the trachea, or whatever. Okay. So now the region outlined by the pleural reflection on the medial surface of the lung is going to be called the hilum, where structure enter and leave. Just think of the hilum and the root of the lung are just one and the same for now. Okay. And you guys will have like, you know, a little bit um, of a distinguishing uh, features of these two later on. If you ever go into, like, for example, uh, lung surgery or something like that. Okay. Now, there is this structure down here. You see that? Each lung has one, and it's called a pulmonary ligament. Okay. And the function of the pulmonary ligament are going to be apparent on the next slide. Now, the root of the hilum is where the parietal pleura reflects on itself to form the visceral pleura. Ah, this is important. This is important. But I'm going to try and explain it very carefully here, but the thing is, I don't think you will be able to understand it very well just yet, but listen, okay, and see how much you can actually know from this explanation. So now you know that there are two membranes that surrounds the surface of the lung, right? There is this visceral pleura that is going to be right on the surface of the lung, and there is a parietal pleura, okay, that's outside here, and in the middle, there is a pleural cavity, but the thing that you don't know is that these two membranes are actually one and the same. They are actually con to continuous with each other. The parietal pleura and the visceral pleura are actually continuous with another. How does that happen? So for example, just imagine that on this surface of the medial side of the lung here, there, there is going to be visceral pleura, okay? The visceral pleura is going to extend down here to the root of the lung, okay? And then that the visceral pleura right here is going to reflect upward like that, in order to be continuous with the parietal pleura right here at the root or the hilum of the lung, right there, okay? So I know that was a little bit difficult, so let us go ahead and just uh, just the, draw out another drawing so that you can understand it a little bit better. Like, for example, this is the lung, right? Now, let me change the color of this in order to make it a little bit better, okay? So you have the visceral pleura right here, right? Visceral pleura is going to go to the surface of the lung, on the surface of the lung like this, right? But then again, when you get to this position here, the hilum right here, okay? The visceral pleura is going to reflect up like that. You see, it's going to reflect up and reflect down like that and continue as the parietal pleura. All right? And the space between them is going to be, once again, the pleural cavity. Okay, so at once again, at the hilum or the root of the lung, the visceral pleura is going to reflect off itself to become the parietal pleura. So the parietal and the visceral pleura are actually one and the same. It's just a little bit of a reflection over here. Okay, let's clear this drawing. It's going to go ahead. There we go. Okay, so these are the hilum of the lung. Okay, 
you section the root very, very close to the lung, you get a hilum. And a hilum is going to have a couple of structures. And these structures are going to be the bronchus over here, okay, the main bronchus, the divisions of the main bronchus, basically. The pulmonary artery, which is in purple here in this image, as well as the pulmonary veins that are in red in this image. The reason why the pulmonary artery is usually purple is that it contains deoxygenated blood, okay, going to the lungs to get the blood. And the pulmonary veins are red because it contains oxygenated blood returning from the lungs to the left atrium in order to be pumped into the systemic circulation. All right. Okay. So now let us go on to the next slide. So yes, let's talk about a pulmonary ligament a little bit. This is the one on the right lung. Okay. This is the one on the left lung. Now, the pulmonary ligament is the thin fold of pleura that projects inferiorly from the root of the lung and extends from the hilum to the mediastinum. Now, it stabilizes the location of the inferior lobe. Like you can see, the inferior lobe is right here. So this pulmonary ligament is going to be primarily going to be at the, the, the inferior lobe, and it's going to stabilize its location. Okay, as, all, as well also accommodate the up and down motion of structures during the root during breathing. This is quite important. During breathing, okay, your diaphragm descends. It goes down. And therefore, your lung has a tendency to kind of just kind of just expand downward. And during this expansion downward, these structures here in the middle, some of them are going to be pulled downward as well. And if you don't have this ligament as a, as a placeholder, some of the structures right here may be strained. Like, for example, these things, when it's going down, it cannot go down if there is no pulmonary ligament, okay? But if there is a pulmonary ligament, let me just erase this, then this area here of the pulmonary ligament is going to expand, okay? And in this expansion, it allows some structure to kind of go down here just a little bit so that these structures are not going to be strained during breathing, okay? It's very important that you recognize the function. Now, there is another function that is very important of the hilum is that when in the uh, so, uh when in surgery we can always use this landmark okay the pulmonary hilum to determine which one is the vagus nerve and which one is the phrenic nerve why because both the phrenic nerve and the vagus nerve are going to go down in the mediastinum right next to the root of the lung like this okay but the thing is the vagus nerve or cranial nerve number 10 I'm going to say, say 10 over here. The vagus nerve is going to descend posterior to the hilum. And the phrenic nerve is going to descend anterior to the hilum. And therefore, if you can locate the hilum, the nerve that's right in front of it is going to be the phrenic nerve. The, the nerve that is right posterior or the, at the back of it is going to be the vagus nerve. Okay, very, very important concept. All right. So now the structures in each of the root of the lung is going to be one pulmonary uh, one pulmonary artery, this one, two pulmonary veins, one, two, one, two, one main bronchus or the division of the main bronchus, as well as some bronchial vessels, nerves, and lymphatics. Just talk about the bronchial vessels a little bit. The bronchial vessels are actually the vessels that actually feeds the, the bronchi as well as the parenchyma of the lung. The pulmonary artery doesn't feed the lung. Remember that, okay? Simply because of the fact that the blood in the pulmonary artery is what? Deoxygenated blood, okay? You cannot use deoxygenated blood to feed the lung. You have to use the bronchial arteries, which contain oxygenated blood to feed the lung, okay? Very important. Now, on the right side, right lung right here, okay? The lobar bronchus to the superior lobe branches in the root, and the branch bronchi are posterior to the pulmonary artery. But on the left side, the main bronchus does not branch until later in the lung, and the main bronchus is inferior to the pulmonary artery. This is a lengthy and wordy two lines, but I'm going to just summarize it right here for you. You see these, these bronchus right here on the right lung? See how there's two of them? And see how there's only one of them in the left lung? That is because the division of these two secondary bronchi, okay, we, we call it secondary because it divides for the main or the primary bronchi, Okay, this division happens early. And therefore, by the time it arrives at the hilum, there are two of them. Okay, but there's only one of them because it hasn't divided yet. It goes into the hilum and then it divides. Okay, so that's number one. 
Number two is that the, on the right lung, the pulmonary artery is going to be right anterior to the bronchi right here. You see that? This, this anterior and this is posterior. But here in the left lung, notice how the pulmonary artery has become markedly superior to the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary veins. Why is that important? Okay, we are going to have to talk about a in a little bit. Okay, the position of the high level of the lung on an X-ray, and the the reason why you have the high level of the lungs on the X-ray is because of the blood mostly in the pulmonary artery. Okay, and therefore. In the pulmonary artery on the right side, because it's anterior to the bronchus, so it cannot be that high. And so the pulmonary artery, the, the hilum of the lung, so to speak, on the x-ray, is going to be lower on the right lung. And on the left lung, it's going to be a little bit higher. It's going to be a little bit superior. Okay. And so when we look, when we look at that slide and when we look at an x-ray image, I will show you how that is. Okay. It's very, very interesting. It's very, very important clinical correlate. Now, the right lung, okay? This is the right lung right here. The right lung is going to have three lobes and two fissures, okay? And what are those lobes and what are those fissures? Number one, do you see this fissure right here that runs like this, okay? This one is called the horizontal fissure, okay? Now, there is another that runs like that, okay? runs like an oblique plane right here. You can call it the oblique fissure. And therefore, the right lungs have two fissures, the horizontal and the oblique fissure. Okay. Now, don't be mistaken that these fissures are only there at the front part or the anterior part of the lung. If you look at the right lung, posteriorly, you will see that the oblique fissure is going to start very high up on the posterior side of the right lung. It's going to go down like that and eventually it's going to go down over here, okay? But the horizontal fissure doesn't start until here, okay, until this point right here, okay? And knowing the location of these fissures and the location of the lobes in relation to these fissures are going to be very important in auscultating the different lobes of the lung moving forward. And I will actually include these positions on the slide, okay? But let's talk about the lobes for uh, a minute here. Okay, you have these fissures in the horizontal and the oblique fissure, and you have this one, okay? The superior lobe or the upper lobe of the right lung, that's what it's called, okay? And the right lung also have a middle lobe right here. And the right lung also have an inferior or a lower lobe. Right here. So upper lobe, middle lobe, lower lobe, okay? But you can also call it superior lobe, middle lobe, and inferior lobe, okay? Pick one set. Okay. Usually I will go with upper, middle, and lower simply because of the fact that it's just easier to remember. But, but, uh, you just choose one. Just choose one that you, that, that, that is more comfortable for you and stick with that. Okay. You don't need to learn two sets. It's just not very practical. All right. So, yeah. So you have like, you know, the horizontal fissure, the bleak fissure, and you have the upper, the middle, and the inferior lobe. Notice how the middle lobe is only there at the right lung. You will not see a middle lobe at the left lung, okay? The left lung only have a superior or the upper lobe and the inferior or the, uh, or the uh, lower lobe. And it is divided by only the oblique fissure. Okay, but now enough, um, enough uh, goofing around. Let's go back to the right lung. So now the lobes are normally freely movable against each other because they are separated by fissures. These fissures allow a certain degree of movement in between the lobes. Okay? Now, there are two lobes, two fissures on the right lung, the oblique fissure, the horizontal fissure. We talked about it before. And in quiet inspiration, I, I mean, I'm sorry, in quiet respiration, the approximate position of the oblique fissure can be marked by a curved line that begins posteriorly at the spinous process of T4. Right here. You see that? Spinous process of T4, and then it's going to curve right here, and it's going to cross the fifth intercostal space laterally, right here at this position, and then it's going to follow the contour of rib six, more or less anteriorly. And if you know the location of oblique fissure, you immediately know where the lower lobe is, right? Because everything that is lower than the, the than this oblique fissure right here is going to be the lower lobe. And therefore, if you put your stethoscope right here, what are you auscultating? 
the lower lobe, okay? And that is how you can tell the lobes apart by ascertaining, or actually not ascertain, but more like to approximate the fissures on a living person on the outside. And that is why these lines are important, okay? So now, horizontal fissure. Horizontal fissure is going to follow the fourth intercostal space, okay? Right here, okay, from the sternum. So it's going to follow it right here on the sternum, right here, right here to the lateral side, and then it's going to meet up with the oblique fissure as it crosses rib five, okay? So rib five is right here, is going to meet up right here, and therefore, you know that the horizontal fissure and the oblique fissure are going to meet each other right at this location. And everything above, okay, the horizontal fissure and above the oblique fissure right here, what's going to be? Upper lobe, okay? Everything else is middle lobe. All right. So now let's go to the right lung and the medial surface of the right lung. The medial surface of the right lung are going to be indented by structures in the mediastinum and root of neck. We talked about this before, and now let's see what these structures are, okay? I'm not going to show you every structure, okay? But it is your job, should you uh, are a clinician and you require knowledge about these, uh, about these structures, to look at these structures within an atlas and study them again, okay? Until you gain a knowledge and understanding of them, okay? But now, let me give you a hint on how I usually learn these structures, okay? So now, you have the heart right here, right? Okay, you have the heart right here. Now, these impressions are very, very close to each other, okay? So now, if you have a heart right here, and on the right side, what chamber should that be? The right chambers, right? Especially the right atrium. So the cardiac impression are mostly going to be the right atrium, the heart. So now, what is going to go up from here and goes down and connect to the right atrium from the superior side? What vein is that on the right side? Yes, that would be superior vena cava. And that's why this groove is the groove for the superior vena cava over here. Now, there is a structure that's going to join the superior vena cava right here, okay? And that's a vein. What vein is that? What vein is going to join the superior vena cava right here as the, as the level when it almost goes to the right atrium, the heart? Which one? A zygous vein. I know, I know you haven't learned that yet, but we will, but we will mention it more in the, uh, in the mediastinal structure lecture. Okay, the azygous vein is a vein that mostly going to be on the posterior side, but then it's going to go and bring blood from the IVC, the inferior vena cava, up and join with the superior vena cava up here. Okay, and therefore, you know that it has to be the azygous vein because it joins the superior vena cava. Okay, and now the superior vena cava is going to be made up, made up of two brachiocephalic veins. One on the right, which is this one, that's going to indent here. Okay, so now... Uh, posterior to the brachiocephalic veins, there are two structures. There are two tubular structures. There's, there's this structure here called the trachea, and there's a structure here called the esophagus. Okay, The trachea is always going to be more, an more anterior than the esophagus. The esophagus is going to be the most posterior structure. Okay, And if you know that, then you have already figured out the majority of the indentations here on the right line. Okay, It's just that simple. Okay, but you have to know the anatomical structures and you have to know their relationships to each other. All right, so now let's examine the left lung. The left lung is smaller than the right lung. Why? Cardiac notch. Yes, that is correct. Okay, the left lung only have two lobes and it's only have one fissure, the oblique fissure. And the oblique fissure is slightly more oblique than the right lung. Okay, so its fissure is going to be like this. On the right lung is more, I would say, less oblique. And here is more oblique. Okay. Now, in quiet respiration, the approximate lo uh, location of the left oblique fissure can be marked by a curved line beginning posteriorly between the spinous processes of T3 and T4, aka this here is going to begin here. Okay, and it's going to cross the fifth intercostal space laterally at this location, and it is going to follow the contour of the sixth rib anteriorly, just like on the right oblique fissure. Now. There is a left cardiac notch. There is no right cardiac notch, okay? There is an also a greater cardiac impression relative to the right lung that's on the left lung. And therefore, that is the reason why the left lung is smaller, okay? The area for the heart to indent to right here is bigger than in the, than in the right lung. You know why? 
Do you know why? Yes, because the heart actually expands a little bit more to the left in a resting person. Okay, heart a heart is like you know it's it's in the middle. It's in the media sinus, but the apex of the heart is going to extend a little bit more to the left, and that is why the left lung has to compensate for that. Let's just say. Now, there is a cardiac notch right here on the left lung, and there is also this area on the left lung that is called the lingula. Okay, the lingula of the left lung is a tongue-like extension projecting over the heart bulge. Okay, the heart bulge is this bulge right here that extends over into the left lung like this. Okay, so the lingula is this structure right here. And functionally speaking, the lingula on the left side is basically equivalent in function to the middle lobe on the right side. Okay, and these two are functional functionally the same okay the middle lobe on the right side uh, and the lingula on the left side they are functionally the same okay but there is no horizontal fissure and there is no middle lobe on the left lung remember that okay okay so now indentations the medial surface of the left lung is going to lie close to and it's going to be indented by structures in the mediastinum and root of neck like for example the heart very big cardiac impression here this is a cardiac notch this lingula right here very big cardiac impression. Now, the aortic arch is the vessel that comes out on the left side and is going to curve into this aortic arch right here, okay? And it's going to go down here as the thoracic aorta or, or like, you know, a part of the descending aorta right here. The descending aorta is going to contain two vessels, okay? The thoracic aorta right here and an abdominal aorta, okay? When the aorta pierces the diaphragm and go down into the abdominal cavity, you call it the abdominal aorta, okay? So descending aorta is just a common name that is used to refer to both the thoracic aorta in this case and the, and the abdominal aorta as it goes down, okay? So now, next stop, you have these branches that comes out, okay? These branches that come out of the aorta. You have the brachial cephalic, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, so the subclavian artery is coming out from the aor aorta, that's true. But this is actually a groove for the left brachiocephalic vein. Okay, this is actually a groove for brachiocephalic vein. It doesn't. It doesn't actually goes out from the aorta. My bad. Okay, so the groove of the left brachiocephalic vein is a little bit anterior to the groove of the subclavian artery. Okay, and more posteriorly, you will have an area for the trachea and the esophagus common in this region. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about the tracheobronchial tree. Okay. The tracheal bronchial tree is going to begin with the trachea right here. The trachea begins up here at the level of C5, okay? C5 is the fifth cervical vertebrae, okay? The fifth cervical vertebra, and the trachea is going to extend from that all the way down here, okay? To the level of T the T4 and T5 thoracic vertebrae, okay? And then this trachea is going to bifurcate. It's going to split in two. And a location where it splits in two is going to be this location here called the carina, okay? And the carina is going to be split in two into these structures here, the right main bronchus over here and the left main bronchus over here, okay? Now, each main bronchus is going to be accommodating a lung, okay? So the right main bronchus is for the right lung and the left main bronchus is going to be for the left lung. And now, the main bronchus... I mean, the main bronchi, as they go into each of the lung, they are going to divide further, okay? And they will divide into these lobar bronchi or secondary bronchi, okay? There are three lobar bronchi on the right side, and there are only two lobar bronchi on the left side, okay? So these lobar bronchi is also called the secondary bronchi. Don't forget that. Now, the lobar bronchi, just like the name suggests, is going to feed, I mean, it's going to bring oxygen to, uh, and the uh, air, basically, to the lobes of the lung. And there are three lobar bronchi on the right side because there are three lobes on the right side, okay? So you have the upper lobe, okay, the middle lobe on the right side, and the lower lobe on the right side. And therefore, there are three lobar bronchi on the right. But there are only two of them on the left. Why? Because of the fact that uh, you only have the upper lobe and the lower lobe on the left side of the lung, okay? 
Okay. So now the trachea, if you look, if you can see it very, very carefully, you see these rings here. Those rings are made up of cartilage. Okay. These cartilage rings are going to make up the trachea. But what you don't know is that the 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 rings that make up the uh, the the trachea walls are not going to be this type of cartilage, which is the round type of cartilage with no end. No, it's not going to be like this. Okay, it's not going to be like this. It's going to be more like a C-shaped ring, like that. Okay, this is more anterior. This is more posterior. So there's a gap. Okay, there, there's a gap right here uh, and uh, on the posterior side of these cartilages ring and in this gap you will have a, a structure right here and this structure is going to compose of many things but it, it, but uh, uh, one thing that is very very important within it is going to be the trachealis muscle okay the smooth muscle or the trachealis muscle of the trachea is going to be on the back side of the trachea and the important thing is that if this muscle contract aka they goes um, they they goes into each other then this ring, the cartilage ring that makes up the trachea is going to be constricted, okay? So if this smooth muscle contracts, okay, then the trachea is going to be constricted, okay? You will see it in some instances, okay? In some instances that people can give sympathetic drugs to relax this, okay? To relax these... um these uh, smooth muscle in order to allow, okay, in order to allow the cartilage, uh, cartilage ring to expand, okay? And so sympathetic drugs is going to dilate the trachea and allow more air in, okay? So very important that you guys notice that this is a type of smooth muscle right here on the posterior side of the C-shaped cartilage of the trachea. Now, the main bronchi are going to divide between the lungs into lobar bronchi or so-called the secondary bronchi. And the secondary bronchi are going to divide even further into the segmental bronchi or tertiary bronchi. Okay. Or like three, there we go. Tertiary bronchi. Okay. The segmental bronchi is going to supply the bronchopulmonary segments. Okay. And so what are bronchopulmonary segments? We are actually going to look about it on the next couple of slides. Okay. Now, these bronchi continue to divide and divide within the lungs until it becomes the bronchioles which will ultimately lead to the alveoli where air exchange is going to happen. So air exchange is going to happen very deep into the lung, okay? And these bronchi are going to become eventually smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until they reach these dilated sacs that are called the alveoli or air sacs. And the alveoli is going to be where gas exchange happens. All right, let's move on. Okay, one very important thing about anatomy uh, uh, here, okay? As the trachea goes down and divide into the primary bronchi, okay, the right primary bronchi is more vertical, okay? And it's gonna be a little bit bigger. The left primary bronchi is more horizontal. It's gonna be smaller. So now let's think about it for a second. Let's suppose you have a pediatric patient who has swallowed a coin and that coin is choked, okay, the, the, the kid choked. And now the coin is in his trachea, okay? So now where, where do you think? Where do you think is the most likely route that the coin is gonna go down? Is it gonna be the right or the left main bronchus? Let's think about it for a second. What do you think? If you say the right main bronchus, yes, you are correct, okay? Most of the time, an object, an aspirated object is going to go down here to the trachea and Woof, right here to the right main bronchus. Why? Because it's more vertical and it's bigger, okay? That, however, doesn't say that the object cannot go to the left main bronchus, which does happen in real life, okay? But the thing is, the probability of it going to the right main bronchus is going to be much more than that that goes to the left main bronchus, okay? Yep. Now, Let's talk about the, the bronchopulmonary segments for just a little bit. So what are these? So clinically, physicians is going to divide the lungs into what they're known as bronchopulmonary segment, okay? A bronchopulmonary segment is defined as an area of the lung that is supplied by one 
segmental bronchus, and is a combining branch of the pulmonary artery, which means that, for example, let me just let, let me just go ahead and tell you the pathway again. Trachea, primary bronchus, secondary or lobar bronchus, and then you will have these tertiary or segmental bronchi. Okay, so now each segmental bronchi is going to go into a part. Okay, of the for example, this is the the uh, lobar bronchus that goes to the upper lobe of the right lung. Okay, now there will be three segments on the upper lobe of the right lung. Each is going to be supplied by one branch, okay, of the segmental bronchus. Okay, this segmental bronchus is going to supply this uh, por uh this portion, okay, of the upper lobe of the right lung. This one is going to supply this portion, and this one is going to supply this portion. Why do you need to know this? Because each of these segments is going to be separate from each other. All in the uh, like you know, in the way that is going to be aerated, and in the way that is going to be supplied by blood, as well. Okay, and therefore, if there's a tumor right here, okay, what can you do? You can cut off this segment, and these two segments are going to be fine. Okay, theoretically speaking, okay, you cut off this segment, and these segments are going to be fine. That is why these bronchopulmonary segments are going to be important clinically. You don't learn these for fun because these are hard to learn. You learn these because of the fact that if you are going to be a lung surgeon, eventually you are going to have to do pulmonectomies. Okay, and pulmonectomies doesn't mean that you remove always one lung. Okay, that that does happen, but it's not going to be every time. Okay, sometimes you have to take off portions of the lung. So how do you know which portion to take off and where did that portion? Uh, you know, when, it, when you take off that portion, it's not going to harm the rest of the lung. Well, you cut off the portion that is supplied by one segmental, uh, one segmental bronchus and one branch, one segmental branch of the pulmonary artery, then you'll be fine. Okay, and that's why these bronchopulmonary segments are important. Do you have to learn all of these guys? Well, yes and no. <laughs> no is that you don't have to learn every single one of them right now, okay? Year one of medical school, okay? But when you go on clinicals, please don't forget if you go into, uh, you know, the 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 um the, the pulmonary uh, surgery department, for example, and if you go on and become like you know a a doctor that deals with lung uh, surgery, please don't forget to um review these, okay? Because they are going to be very important for you. Okay. But now I'm just going to go ahead and give you the rundown. Okay, to give you the, the, the rundown so that you understand a little bit about how these segments are going to be um are going to be divided. Okay. For the right lung, on the superior lobe of the right lung or the upper lobe of the right lung, there are three segments. Okay, one segment on top is called the apical segment. Okay. And two segments, one on the anterior side and one on the posterior side. So the right lung superior lobe has three segments. For the middle lobe of the right lung, there's only two segments. There's the lateral segment right here and the medial segment right here. For the inferior lobe of the right lung, there will actually be five segments. Okay, Those five segments are going to be one superior segment up here. Okay, and then there are four segments that are going to be rotating down here on the bottom. Okay, you can see them as best right here on the medial side of the lung. There's going to be, uh, there's going to be a soup. Uh, I'm sorry. There's going to be a medial basal here, a posterior basal here, a lateral basal here that you can see on the lateral side as well, as well as the anterior basal here that you can see on the anterior side. Okay, so that's the right lung. Now for the left lung. The left lung only have a superior lobe and an inferior lobe, okay? So the superior lobe actually is going to have four of these segments, okay? Number one, you have going to be the apical posterior segment, going to be an anterior segment right here, and then two segments that relate to the lingular uh, part of the upper lobe of the left lung, the superior lingular and the inferior lingular, okay? And now for the inferior lobe, there will be four segments. Okay, the superior segment right here, which you can see right here as well, an anterior medial basal segment, 
that you can see right here in yellow, a posterior basal segment that you can only see here on the medial side of the lung. And finally, a lateral basal segment that is right here in brown. All right. So those are the bronchopulmonary segments. Now, let's talk about the pulmonary arteries for a little bit. The pulmonary arteries is going to come from the heart. Okay, It is the artery that brings deoxygenated blood to the lungs so that the lungs can supply these arteries with, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, supply the capillaries with blood so that it becomes the pulmonary veins going back to the left atrium so that the heart can pump it into the systemic circulation. Okay, so now the pulmonary artery are two of them. Okay, one is the right pulmonary artery, two is the left pulmonary artery over here, and they come from this pulmonary trunk right here. Okay, so the pulmonary trunk is going to bifurcate into the right pulmonary and the left pulmonary arteries right here. Now, the bifurcation, okay, of the pulmonary trunk is going to occur anteroinferiorly to the left of the bifurcation of the trachea. What does this even mean? Okay, this is a reminder that you have to practice your uh, directional terms. Okay, what is anterior? Anterior is in front. So the division of the pulmonary trunk into the two pulmonary arteries is going to happen at the front of the trachea. Trachea is in the back. It happens at the front. Okay. And it's going to happen inferior to the bifurcation of the trachea. Bifurcation of the trachea right here is going to be a little bit down from that location. And it's going to be a little bit to the left of the bifurcation of the trachea. So the carinus is right here, bifurcation of the trachea. And it's going to be to the left of that a little bit. You have the pulmonary trunk bifurcation. Okay. So bifurcation of the pulmonary trunk occurs anterior inferiorly to the left of the bifurcation of the trachea because of that. Okay, the right pulmonary artery is going to be a little bit longer than the left, passes horizontally across the mediastinum, and importantly, it also passes anteriorly to the right main bronchus. Okay, so that is why if you use this section, I'm sorry, if you use this section right here to cut, okay, you will have the root of the lung right here. You see, that's the root of the lung. And at the root of the lung, what do you see? You see that the pulmonary artery is going to be right in front of the trachea. I'm sorry, the, of the primary, bron uh, primary bronchus on the right side, right? But then if you section the same way on the left side, what do you say? On the left side, the left pulmonary artery actually rises superior to the left primary bronchus. You see that? Left primary bronchus is right here. This one is actually more superior to that. And therefore, on the root of the left lung, you will see that the left pulmonary artery is going to be superior, not anterior, but superior to the left main bronchus. And why is that important? The important thing is the left pulmonary artery, therefore, is going to always be a little bit higher, a little bit more superior than the right pulmonary artery on the majority of cases in the clinical world. And how do you see that happen in the clinical world? You see these, okay? So now, you, do you see like, you know, right here, you have the heart in the middle, the mediastinum, right? And then you have over here, the two lung fields, okay? Which are going to be the pleural cavity and the lungs, right? And you see these white things, okay? The dense white things that come out of the heart on either side. What are those? Those are the hyla of the lungs, okay? But the hyla of the lungs are mostly going to be composed of the pulmonary arteries. And therefore, the pulmonary artery on the right side or the left side is going to be higher. Okay, so I repeat the question. If you see an x-ray, a normal x-ray, do you think that the right hilum is going to be more superior or more inferior to the left hilum normally? What do you think? Did you say the left hilum is going to be a little bit more superior than the right hilum? If so, yes, you are 100% correct. Why? Because the left pulmonary artery, it rides on top, okay, of the main bronchus. I mean, uh, yeah, the main bronchus on the left side, and therefore it has to be more superior to the right pulmonary artery. And you see it right here on the X-ray. Now, on the X-ray, you see conditions where the right hilum and the left hilum is the same in height as well, okay? It's, it's not it's not, um, you know, out of the realm of norm to have that happen. But 
if the right hilum, this one, is somehow higher than the left hilum, there is an abnormality somewhere that you should look for. Okay, and that is why the knowledge about the pulmonary arteries location is important. Now, let's talk about the bronchial artery veins. The bronchial arteries and veins, okay, the bronchial arteries, let's talk about the first. Bronchial arteries are going to be the nutritive vascular system of the pulmonary tissues, which means what? It's going to be the ones that supply the bronchial tree and the alveoli, okay, and the rest of the lung with oxygenated blood. Remember, when we talk about the pulmonary arteries, we know that the pulmonary arteries do not bring oxygenated blood to the lungs and therefore cannot be the vessel that supply it, okay? The vessels that supply the lung and the bronchial tree are going to be the bronchial arteries, okay? Now, the bronchial arteries are going to be originating from the thoracic aorta or one of its branches. One right bronchial artery, there's only one, is going to arise normally from the third posterior intercostal artery, but occasionally you will see it originate from the upper left bronchial artery. Okay, so here it is right here. This is the third right posterior intercostal artery. And in the third right posterior intercostal artery right here, you can see that there's a right bronchial artery that arises from that. Okay, so that's the right bronchial artery. There's only one of them. But you will see there are two left bronchial arteries. And those two left bronchial arteries arise directly from the thoracic aorta. Okay, you see that this is the thoracic aorta going down. And you will see that there's two left bronchial arteries, one superior one and one inferior one. Okay. And so there's one right bronchial artery normally, but there's two left bronchial arteries normally. Now for the bronchial veins, the bronchial veins is going to drain either into the pulmonary vein or the left atrium directly and into the azygous vein on the right or the superior intercostal vein or hemiazygous vein on the left. And the bronchial veins are actually the veins that, that brings the oxygenated blood all the way back into the heart. Okay, so innervation and lymphatic drainage of the lungs. How's that work? So there are structures of the lung and visceral pleura, and they are innervated by the nerves. Okay, and these nerves are going to be visceral afferent and efferent nerves that are distributed through the anterior and posterior pulmonary plexuses. Okay, so the pulmonary plexuses is going to be right here and right here. And it's going to follow the bronchial tree right into the lungs. So these nerves from these plexuses come from the sympathetic trunks and vagus nerves. The sympathetic trunks are going to uh, be supplying sympathetic stimulation to the lung. And the vagus nerve is going to supply parasympathetic stimulation to the lung. Okay. So if you hear vagus nerve, it's going to be parasympathetic. Okay. Now, if you hear sympathetic trunk, is going to be sympathetic, okay? Very important concept, you need to remember that, okay? Now the vagus nerve is going to constrict the bronchioles, okay, allowing less air into the lungs. The sympathetics is going to dilate the bronchioles, allowing more air into the lungs. Very important concept, you need to know that. Now, there are superficial or subpleural and deep lymphatics of the lung, and they are all going to drain into lymph nodes that are called tracheobronchial nodes around the root of the low bar and main bronchi and along the side of the trachea. So that's lymphatic drainage. These are going to be the lymphatic drainage of the lungs. Okay? You see these nodes right here? Okay, these nodes right here, the tracheal bronchial nodes, those are going to be draining the majority of the lymph that's coming from the lungs. Now, let's talk about the pleural cavity. This is actually very important. So surrounding the lungs, we have already talked about it before, but surrounding the lungs, there are pleural cavities. And the pleural cavities, one on the right and one on the left, okay? So you have the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. And you see this. The visceral pleura and the parietal pleura are actually one and the same, okay? But at the hilum of each lung, the visceral pleura is going to reflect upon itself to form the parietal pleura, okay? So these structures are actually one and the same. Remember, it's very important, okay? So now within the two pleurae, okay, there's a space, the space is called the visceral pleura. And in a living person, as I said before, it's going to be lubricated by a thin layer of fluid. Very, very thin. Emphasis on thin. Okay. But this layer of fluid is going to allow pleural, the, the pleura, okay, to slide on top of each other when we perform respiration. Okay. The smooth, the smooth um, 
uh, pleural movements on top of each other are going to be because there is fluid within this cavity. All right, so now you know that the parietal pleura is and you know what the visceral pleura is, so let's move on. Okay, the pleural cavity is the potential space between the parietal and visceral pleura. Normally only contain a very thin layer of sterile fluid with help from lung sliding. Lung sliding, what is lung sliding? Movement of the parietal and visceral uh, pleura on top of each other. So now, parietal pleura, okay, we are anatomists. So anatomists tend to cause trouble to people by naming way too many things, okay? And this is no exception. For the parietal pleura, okay, there are several sections of the parietal pleura. And you will hear terms such as diaphragmatic pleura, mediastinal pleura, okay, cervical pleura, or the cupola, or the um, lat uh, or the, the costal pleura. So what do these terms mean? I thought there's only parietal and visceral pleura. Okay, so now let's think about it for a second, okay? So now you see, this is a drawing that illustrates the pleura, okay? Or more specifically, the parietal pleura, okay? The parietal pleura are going to be in contact with a couple of things, okay? If it is in contact with the ribs right here, you see that? There is a portion here that's going to be in contact with the ribs and the intercostal space. So what do we call it? We call it the costal pleura, costal part, okay? Now, how about down here? Down here, the pleura is going to be uh, in contact with the diaphragm. So what do we call it? The diaphragmatic part of the parietal pleura, okay? How about, how about here in the middle? In the middle, what is in the middle? The mediastinum. And therefore, you have the mediastinal pleura or the mediastinal part of the parietal pleura. One and the same thing. So now, up here, it has the uh, relationship to the neck, okay? And the, the, the base of the neck, basically. So what do we call it? The cervical pleura, also known as the pleural copula. All right, so the cervical pleura is the part of the pleura that is going to be in contact with the neck, okay? And so all of these parts are part of the parietal pleura that's going to be in contact with different parts of the thoracic cap. Now, at the root of the lung, the mediastinal pleura will reflect onto the surface of the lung, becoming the visceral pleura. And the location of reflection is right here at the hilum or the root of the lung. Okay, as well as leaving a space down here, the pulmonary uh, the pulmonary ligament. Okay, very important for structures to slide up and down. Okay, with no strain. Now, the visceral pleura is going to continue with the parietal pleura, and the root of each lung is going to be firmly attached to the surface of the lung, very, very firmly attached. Okay, so much that when you dissect out the lung, okay you will be able to see the surface of the lung. But what you see really isn't the surface of the lung because the surface of the lung is going to be covered by visceral pleura. So you're actually going to see the visceral pleura on the lung. All right? So it's going to adhere very closely to the surface of the lung. Now, there is no pain receptors on the visceral pleura, and therefore you generally don't feel pain, okay, from the visceral pleura. Now, you will have these things called the pleural recesses, okay? You will see it a little bit better if we go back to this image here. Uh, see how there are a couple of recesses right here where the visceral pleura that right here and the parietal pleura go so far from each other that it becomes a potential space? That is going to be what are known as pleural recesses, and there are a couple of them, okay? So there is this one right here called a costal diaphragmatic recess. Why is that? This is the diaphragm, okay? And this is the ribs over here. So costal diaphragmatic recess, okay? So what is that? That is the portion of the parietal pleura that goes way deep into this side of the diaphragm, okay? And is going to perform a, a potential space, right? It is not going to be important physically. I mean, physiologically. But when you have fluid in this area, this area is going to dilate. And when it dilates, you will see the fluid right here if you do an ultrasound, okay? And therefore, that is why this, this thing is important because when you do an ultrasound trying to assert, uh, uh, ascertaining um, the presence of pleural fluid, where do you put the probe? Right here, okay, right here. Because if you don't put the probe right there, 
most likely you're not going to see uh, be able to see any. Okay, so that's the costal diaphragmatic reason. Right here in the middle, you will also have this thing called a costal mediastinal recess. Okay, and you will see it a little bit better in this image here. And the costal mediastinal recess is another one of these floral recesses. Okay, so now you will see that there is a space, right? There is a space at the lower end of the visceral pleura here and the parietal pleura. And those spaces are going to be quite different from each other. And usually these spaces are going to be two rib spaces apart. This is clinically very important. So now I need to understand, uh, I need to say it to you so that you understand it, okay? So now the position of the bottom of the lung, AKA the position of the bottom of the visceral pleura. Why a visceral pleura very, very tightly attached to the surface of the lung, right? And the position of the parietal pleura these two are going to be different than each other. They're not going to be the same place, okay? Now, the parietal pleura usually is going to extend a little bit inferiorly than the visceral pleura, okay? And therefore, usually, it's going to be at a lower level than the bottom of the lung. And the difference is usually two ribs apart. So at the midclavicular line, the position of the bottom of the lung is at the sixth rib level. And the position of the parietal pleura is going to be the eighth rib level, two ribs space apart. Okay. At the mid axillary line, the difference is going to be at the eighth rib for the bottom of the lung and at the tenth rib for the parietal pleura. And at the paravertebral line, you will have the eleventh rib being the bottom of the lung and the twelfth rib being the parietal pleura position. What does that mean? That means that the bottom of the pleura, the, of the parietal pleura are always going to be two, I'm sorry, it's go, always going to be two rib spaces lower than the position of the visceral pleura, okay? At the midclavicular line, the line that goes to the middle of the clavicle, the difference is gonna be rib six and eight, okay? Right here at the mid axillary line, the line that goes through the middle, okay? Uh, is going to go through the middle of the uh, uh, of your axilla, your armpit, so to speak. The difference is going to be rib 8 and rib 10. And right here at the paravertebral line at the back, the difference is going to be rib 10 and rib 12. Okay? And therefore, there's always going to be that difference between the visceral and parietal pleura. And notice one more thing, one last thing. Okay? Is that the front or the anterior surface of the lung Okay, the inferior border of the anterior surface of the lung are always going to be more superior than the posterior surface of the lung. Why? Because here at the midclavicular line is the, this surface here is at rib six, while here at the posterior surface of the lung is at rib ten. Okay, so there is going to be a difference, and that difference is going to be that the posterior part of the lung is always going to extend further inferior than the anterior part of the lung. All right, so now let's go to clinical correlations of the pleural cavity. There are two clinical correlations that I would like to go over with you today, and one of them is pleural effusion. So now remember when I talk about how in the, in the middle of the uh, parietal and visceral pleura, there's a thin film of fluid, emphasis on thin, right? So what happens if there's more than just a thin film of fluid? Oh, then you have pleural effusion. Pleural effusion is when excess fluid, more fluid than just a thin film, accumulates within the pleural space. And if it accumulates too much, it is going to collapse the lung, okay? Now, the fluid usually is going to accumulate first at the costal diaphragmatic recess, especially when the patient is standing, okay? And therefore, you will be able to see it on the radiograph, aka an x-ray, as well as on an ultrasound of a patient, okay? Now, Pleural effusion can be caused by many different pathologies, like a TB or like a tuberculosis, a heart failure, or even cancer. And it can be aspirated. You can insert a needle, okay? You can insert a needle right here, okay? And aspirate this fluid. Take this fluid for laboratory work in order to ascertain the nature of the fluid, okay? Now, a treatment for a large effusion is going to be the drainage of the effusion, which means you insert a drain, 
okay? A needle right here that's going to be connected to a drain. And that needle is going to drain out the fluid, okay? And so the patient doesn't have the fluid within uh, their pleural cavities anymore, okay? All right, so now this is a radiograph or an X-ray of a right pleural effusion, okay? So now the right pleural effusion is going to accumulate down here first because gravity is pulling the fluid down, okay? And so you see that there is a white portion here that represents the pleural fluid, okay? And usually on this film, this costophrenic angle representing the costal diaphragmatic recess is going to white out first on the pleural effusion. And then the fluid is just going to go up and up and up until it forms this curve right here called the curve of Damazor. Okay, so that's pleural effusion. All right, so now let's go on to examine the second one, pneumothorax. What is pneumothorax? Usually within the pleural cavity, there's no air. But for example, if a patient has a gunshot wound, okay, and that, and that bullet pierces the pleural cavity, then air from the outside is going to leak inside of the uh, of the pulmonary cavity. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, of the pleural cavity, and forms a pneumothorax. And so, pneumothorax is a collection of gas within the pleural cavity. Okay, and it's going to equalize the pleural pressure within the atmosphere. Uh, I'm sorry, it's going to equalize the pleural pressure with atmospheric pressure. And when these two pressures equalize, it's going to cause the collapse of the lung. The mechanism of which you will study further in physiology. So basically, the danger of pneumothorax is that it collapses the lung and makes the lung unusable. Like for example, right here, you can see that there is a difference between the right lung and the left. The right lung right here, we have these vessels, okay, right here that they and they form these vessels form these white markings. Okay, we also call them lung markings or pulmonary markings. That is going to go to the periphery of the lung. Right, but what happens on the right uh, on the left side? There's nothing. There's no vascular markings. There's no pulmonary marking. And why is that? Because the left lung is right here. Okay, it has collapsed down to be this very small structure right here, and therefore you don't see any pulmonary markings on the side here. Okay, now if enough gas accumulates, it can push the mediastinal structure to the opposite side. Okay, so if you have too much gas. For example, on the left side, right here, the whole mediastina, okay, which is this part here, can be pushed to the right side, okay. And when it pushes the right side, there is pressure that is exerting on the superior vena cava, that is exerting on the aorta, that is going to make the heart harder to pump blood. And you can actually understand how dangerous that is, okay. And this condition, where enough gas accumulates and it pushes the mediastinum to the opposite side is going to be called a tension pneumothorax. And it's going to be an urgent treatment is required. An urgent treatment is required here because it's an, it's an emergency case, okay? Tension pneumothorax, very, very dangerous, okay? Now, pneumothorax can be caused by many things, including a spontaneous pneumothorax, which means the, the, uh, the lung just spontaneously, like, you know, it's, it's, is simply air simply leaks into the pulmonary. I'm sorry, air simply leaks into the pleural cavity from, for example, a rupture of a bullet. Okay, it can be caused by trauma, like for, for example, gunshot wound. It can be caused by inflammation or smoking or other pulmonary disease or result of positive ventilation. Okay, now the symptoms really depends on the degree and rate of air leak. Okay, but there can be pain. There can be shortness of breath. There can even be cardiorespiratory collapse, especially if we talk about a tension pneumothorax. Okay, and now you can also see that there's an area right here. There's no vascular marking. That's a pneumothorax, and this is a CT. Okay, that's a CT of the chest. All right, and that is all for this lesson about the lungs and the pleura. Thank you very much for sticking with me so far. If you have any question, please leave your comment down here or ask me in class so that I can get to these comments and answer your question as soon as possible. My name is Kwa once again, and uh, I hope to see you in the next lessons. Bye-bye.